Um, let me begin by extending their deepest sympathies on behalf of the Social Democrats to those who have lost their lives to the COVID-19 crisis and their endless thanks to those who continue to put themselves in the front line and in harm's way. It is often said that a crisis makes us focus on what is really important and what this crisis has shown us is that it's not full employment we should crave alone but the focus must be on the nature of our work. Our work must be secure, it must pay appropriately, it should be unionised. The crisis, the crisis has shown us what work we cannot live without. Waste collectors, cleaners, nurses, retail staff. It has not gone unnoticed that those we pay the least are those who have mattered most to society during this particular crisis. It has shown us that a healthcare system based on need rather than ability to pay is non-negotiable. It allowed politicians in this chamber en masse to recognise public good in their constitution does in fact allow a rent freeze. It has proven that childcare is beyond inaffordable. Our childcare system is widely in need of reform and our childcare workers, so highly trained yet poorly paid, should be paid directly by the state. There is the old conservative trope that the problem with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. What this crisis has proved to us is that unchecked capitalism cannot survive without state intervention. And this is absolutely the time when we must begin the conversation of how we keep our newly acquired public health care, our public child care and our security of tenure that has been a lifeblood for so many families during this period of crisis. Health, housing and child care, so long the big three unsolvable issues were improved drastically in a very short space of time, proving that the political leadership needed for so long was what was actual fact lacking. Now our job, the job of those who view ourselves as being progressive in this chamber, is to ensure that these disaster measures that have preserved the basic decency in many families throughout Ireland are there even when this disaster abates. And still there are some areas where we are failing. That we are sitting here today provides the opportunity to highlight some of the groups that are being left behind and some of the gaps that still exist in our social protection structures that have stepped up enormously over the last couple of weeks. And I think it was unfortunate the comments that were made by the Minister a short period of time ago. And I'll accept no shame for representing my constituents when I'm called to do so in this House. There are a number of questions I would ask, direct questions, which I appreciate may not have the answers to today, but would appreciate if we can get the answers to shortly. For example, for people who get their fuel allowances paid in two lump sums, how and when will those how and when will these people get their extra weeks? For the sta those who are staffing the helplines at the moment, who we should praise, those staff lines are inadequately, there is not enough people on them at the moment. And those who are looking to avail of the staff lines will find themselves waiting all day for a response to their queries. I think we need to step up the staff lines and improve the level of staffing that are existing on them, notwithstanding the immense um, goodwill we should extend to those currently staffing them. There is the issue already raised of those under the age of 18 who have been in part-time employment who have been let go and who need to afford some degree of this pandemic payments to under 18s. Those who are always stepping up in households of low income and providing an extra source of security and that's now been removed. That was for their extra data, it was for their Netflix that so many are relying on at the moment. And if that's gone now, the burden will be felt in many households. I've also been asked with people who've had in precarious employment who've had two part-time jobs, where one part-time job has been removed, they're now ineligible for the pandemic payment. I think we need to step up and offer some degree of payment to people who've lost one of their incomes. There's also the important issues that's been raised over the last couple of days that absolutely needs to be resolved. It's the fact that pregnant women who were let go because of COVID-19 and are within 16 weeks of their due date must apply for maternity benefit. Women are absolutely entitled to 26, maternity, 26 weeks maternity leave and there needs to be clarity regarding whether some women who are forced to start their maternity leave six weeks early will therefore only get 10 weeks maternity leave once they give birth or less if they are overdue. Urgent clarity is needed here. What this opportunity also affords us is to give voice to those who are voiceless at this current time. This week, dozens of specialists spanning fields of health systems, of public health, of social policy, of law, of human rights, of migration and equality activists wrote to their government expressing their concern that the state is continuing at this time to require large numbers of people seeking international protection 
to live in shared bedrooms and to share sanitary and eating facilities within the rec vision system. This has prevented many people from socially distancing those systems in accordance with government advice, with the aim of avoiding contra contracting COVID-19 and avoiding passing the virus to others. It is absolutely crucial that individuals living within direct revision are included within the government's approach to safeguarding public health at this worry worrying time. I'm reminded of the comments that the Minister for Health made a couple of weeks ago that a, pan a pandemic affords no opportunity for a, a double-tier health service. I would argue strongly that during a time of pandemic, we cannot continue with a system of incarceration. We simply cannot do that. We already see in some quarters around how we already see conversation in some quarters around how we will pay long term for the impacts of COVID-19. And although our political climate has changed utterly, I fear for our political I fear that our future political leadership will not. Austerity, perhaps by another name, will potentially be on the cards and we'll fight this every step of the way. As someone who was politicised by austerity, coming from an area of Dublin that was utterly decimated by austerity. I believe now is the time that we start ensuring that we never go back there. Several times in public commentary over the last couple of weeks, I've heard people in positions of seniority argue that hard decisions will have to be made in the future. Hard decisions to me seems to be a euphemism for what happened during the period of 2011 to 2016, where hard decisions was made as a reason as to why we further punish or under, further devalue the role that lone parents play in our society where we destroyed the community development sector and where we eroded public services. If those are the hard decisions being referred to here, we will fight them every step of the way, as we should. The SRI's current quarterly economic commentary was published this week with some fairly stark predictions, showing the possibility for a 7% fall in GDP, a doubling of unemployment to 12.6%, and a rise in deficit of GDP ratio of minus 4.3%. There will be limits to the choices that we take next. We have already accepted quite spectacularly that our current social welfare rates were not good enough to live on. It will be, it will be hard to roll this back. It has been proven to us just how much Airbnb was affecting our housing stock. This cannot be unseen. After our experience of a single tier health service that works for us when we need it, we will not tolerate going back to the old regime of waiting lists for those who cannot pay. And whilst it is true that our old policies had a cost, a low tax base, for example, has a cost, a two-tier health service is expensive to run. It is clear that returning to our old spending levels may not be instantaneously possible. Yet where does this leave us? A recession caused by lockdown aside, we all agree that slanted care on speed and or our new income reports that actually support people when they need it most are not possible given our current tax base. One hard decision that might need to be made, perhaps, is that the tax cuts proposed just a short time ago, in my view, shamefully, by the three medium-sized parties, must be taken off the table. No longer is it acceptable to gamble with our public services and our state's ability to provide a safety net when we need it most. Alongside this, it's time for everyone to pay their fair share of tax. When it comes to corporation tax, this is a republic. The message simply has to get through. If you arrive here to do business, and if it's working out well for you, we expect you to contribute. Because donning the green jersey in this case means a commitment to investing in our vital social infrastructure, which is needed from all political parties. Because now we have learned truly what is important and how quickly those who was elected to this house can respond. There is no going back. I want to briefly finish by touching on educational and entrenched educational inequalities that is going to be exasperated by our current COVID-19 pandemic. There is a fear amongst many working in DESH schools that the current system where DESH students are working from home is going to entrench the inequality that already exists there. I think in the public narrative at the moment that's focused mainly on the, um, the digital divide. But there is broader divisions that have already existed there. For many, it's not only a digital void while they're trying to study for a leaving cert. It's the inability to have a, a table to work from. There is, for many students in Ireland at the moment, an inequality of peace and quiet where they can't simply close the door and to study for their leaving cert. This needs to be factored into their considerations of how we, how we approach these difficult decisions around the leaving cert. We need to develop things like a digital fund to provide support to students. We need to help our desk skills. Um, there are other factors there as well. I mean, students with um, students currently undertaking the leaving cert applied, for example, are being lost completely in the narrative. 
and their leaving cert and their education is important as anybody else's. And I'd ask that these decisions and these factors are taken into consideration with a degree of urgency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deb